Welcome to Conversations with Big Rich. This is an interview style podcast. These interviewed are all involved in the off-road industry. Being involved like all of my guests are is a lifestyle, not just a job. I talk to past, present, and future legends, as well as business owners, employees, media, and land use warriors. Men and women who have found their way into this exciting and addictive lifestyle we call off-road. We discuss their personal history, struggles, successes, and reboots. We dive into what drives them to stay active in off-road. We all hope to shed some light on how to find a path into this world that we live and love and call off-road. Whether you're crawling the Red Rocks of Moab or hauling your toys to the trail, Maxxis has the tires you can trust for performance and durability. Four wheels or two. Maxxis tires are the choice of champions because they know that whether for work or play, for fun or competition, Maxxis tires deliver. Choose Maxxis. Tread victoriously. Have you seen Four Low Magazine yet? Four Low Magazine is a high-quality, well-written, four-wheel drive-focused magazine for the enthusiast market. If you still love the idea of a printed magazine, something to save and read at any time, Four Low is the magazine for you. Four Low cannot be found in stores, but you can have it delivered to your home or place of business. Visit fourlowmagazine.com to order your subscription today. On today's episode of Conversations, I get to interview Matt Dees. From rock crawler to family man to North Carolina cowboy. Matt Dees, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Rich. How are you doing? Doing excellent. Glad to get you on here. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm glad you got glad to glad to be on here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's gonna be fun. Reminisce about those old days because you're one of the exactly. OGs, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though you what you're you're in your forties now? Uh forty two, yeah. 42. December I turned forty two. You're yeah. still a kid. You know, that's when I started doing the cow rock events is that right you're 42 42 huh? yep wow it's amazing yeah. it's crazy how fast time goes that's for sure absolutely so let's uh let's find out more about you and uh, where were you born and raised uh so i was born actually in bradenton florida um we moved to western north carolina i was I think I just turned two years old, so I've been here, you know, I tell everybody I'm from here, I've been here 40 years anyway, or a little over 40, and um, I, I don't even really remember, you know, besides going back and seeing family in Florida and stuff, I don't even really remember anything about it, just, this is home to me, you know. Right, and what what created the move? Did your parents move because of work, or family, yeah. or what was it? Kind of work in family. So I, I've got an older brother and, you know, back, even back then, you know, like crime and drugs and all that. And then that part of Florida was starting to kind of escalate and stuff. And, and my mom and dad, they, they just elected, they didn't want to raise, you know, two kids in that environment or whatever. So we, uh, they, they moved here. I had my, let's see, it'd be my dad's uh, parents. They had a summer home up here. And so we come here on vacation a lot and it's always just been kind of a, you know, small, quiet town or whatever. And, and so anyhow, that's, that's kind of what brought us, brought us here in North Carolina. So how many, how many people are in the town you're at now? Man. So <clears throat> now it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty big town, you know, far as like overpopulated, it, it turned into uh, one of the most, visited um bryson city is actually one of the most visited um destinations in the world right now uh tourism just absolutely took this place over um numbers wise now i have no idea i mean really back in the 80s and even early 90s and stuff there was there was really not a lot of jobs it was kind of a poor area and man there's so many multi-millionaires that's moved in here especially after covid when when covid hit you know everybody went out of the cities and they wanted to move here or, you know, towns like this, and, um, man, it's just, it's crazy the amount of people, you know, just to get through our little town, and the the town hasn't really changed the infrastructure of it, so you can imagine it's like a, it's a zoo, you know, just trying to get through to the bank or the grocery store. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's not the little quiet town I grew up in, that's for sure. So is it artsy now? Is that what it is that, that's attracting um, the visitors, yeah. or? Out, outdoor, we, so, you know, people that are big into fishing, like fly fishing or whatever, ah. um, we have some of the the, mo the best fly fishing there is, trout fishing, um, mountain biking's huge, whitewater rafting, 
Um, of course, we have the casino now. Uh, it, it's just, yeah, a lot of it's outdoorsy type stuff, you know. Okay. So what was it like uh, going to school there? Man, it was, uh, I loved my childhood going to school and stuff. It was, I don't know, man, it, it was never really any um, issues growing up. You know, it was just, I, I think I graduated, there was, I think there was 89 of us, you know. And so everybody knew everybody. And, and to an extent, it's that way now. Um, you go to a restaurant or something like that, you know, you look around, you're like, wow, I don't know really anybody in here. You know, 15, 20 years ago, you knew everybody in the restaurant. So, uh, but no, my childhood was great, man. School was great. Um, what I'd give to go back. <laughs> <laughs> what did you, uh, did you play sports or anything like that? Yeah. Um, actually, yeah, I played baseball quite a bit in my younger years. And then my dad got me into go-kart racing when I was around about six. I still continue to play baseball. And um, slowly the racing kind of took took over and quit playing baseball and didn't play any sports really until I got into um, into high school and actually started playing football. What position did you play? Um, let's see. I was tailback and strong safety. Okay. Nice. Did you do any scouting or anything like that? No, I was, I was just, I mean, I, I was good enough to start, but I was, nah, you know, just an average football player, okay. <laughs> average athlete, you know. And, uh, what about grade wise in school? Were you a good student or were you one of those that was always looking to get out of the building? Uh, hey man, I was just, I just good enough to get by, you know, <laughs> I, I, guess, I, I, guess, I guess it wasn't really that I struggled academically. I mean, the work wasn't, didn't ever really seem to be that difficult, but, um, I always had my mind on, you know, Wow, man, I'd like to be at the shop, or I got a race coming up. I can't wait to get out of school so I can go get, you know, get the carts and everything ready to go. And I don't know. I guess I just didn't apply myself. Did you? Uh, did you have technical classes? You know, metal shop, wood shop, those kind of things. No, you know what's crazy, man, is I, I didn't even take auto mechanics or anything in school. Um, I, I just got through, just done the normal classes or whatnot. Um, it, it was a lot of people would always give me a hard time, you know, because my dad owned a body shop for 47 and a half years. And that's, you know, when I got out of high school, that's what I, I started doing. I, I did, I did get my welding degree. I, I went on and got certified in welding doing night classes once I graduated. But, um, I, I didn't want to sound like I knew everything, but it was just kind of the stuff they were learning. It just, it, I don't know. It, it, I was, I'd already been through all that and been around them my whole life. So I just felt like it was kind of a waste of time. You know? Right. Okay. And, uh, those those years, your dad owned the body shop, so I would imagine you know you're around cars all the time and stuff. Um, did you guys did you guys get outdoors? Um, did you go camping, wheeling, anything like that as a family? Um, no, I, I really didn't get into off roading until shortly after I graduated high school. Um, a, a lot of what my dad and I did growing up is is you know spend a lot of time together at the shop after school and stuff, getting go karts ready. I raced um, go karts from the time I was six till I guess I was about sixteen. Well, you know, whenever I when I quit messing with it or whatever, mainly just because football and stuff was taking you know taking a lot of time and and whatnot. They want you at you know in the weight room a lot. They want you doing this all the time, different camps and you know it just I just didn't have the time to to put into it to be successful. So um, started started playing football, but. But no, uh, we didn't. We never do a whole lot of that kind of stuff. So, how did you get into uh, off roading then? Um, I'd always, I'd always was intrigued by it, you know, and thought it was neat. So, my junior year, um, I was, I was actually sounds like I'm bragging, but so I was pretty, pretty good at snowboarding, and um, I was going. My mom was going to Colorado. We were going to Breckenridge. Well, I was going to be there for a month. And my mom was going out to train some people on some computer stuff um, at this resort. And my brother actually partied with this guy in college that later went on and got in with ride snowboards. And so I was going to be out there for a month, and I was going to meet up with that guy, potentially get a sponsorship with ride snowboards. And that was my junior year. I was going to be there a month. And the first run, um, I ended up breaking two vertebrae in my back. Oh, geez. And yeah, so, um, 
I laid in the hospital for, I think it's four or five days. And obviously that ended the, you know, the chance of getting sponsored or whatever. So ended up uh, coming back home and um, had to stay in a brace for, God, I mean, I think it was like eight weeks or something like that. Like when those halo braces or whatnot. So I never, I never was able to, you know, pursue that dream or whatever. You know, I continued snowboarding, but just wasn't able to go at it like I did before, you know. Right. And then the off-roading, just a shoot, an offshoot of, of hanging out with friends that had four-wheel drivers. Yeah, or so, a Jeep or... yeah so to the continuation of that story is like um, my brother was, his roommate in college or whatever, had a CJ5. And, you know, college kids always being broke or whatever. The, the roommate went to my dad and said, would you be interested in buying this CJ five? I'm, I'm really needing the money. And, um, he bought it just before this happened before I broke my back. So anyway, he buys it. And I told him, I guess he was feeling bad for me being in the hospital. He's like, I told him, I said, I'd really like to build that Jeep. And but the conversation before I got hurt was, well, I, I didn't really buy it to keep it. I bought it to sell it and make money on it. And anyway, he ended up giving me the Jeep <laughs> and come home. Once I got healed up, you know, a month or two later, um, started ordering some parts and this and that and the other. And it was kind of just like a, I don't know, we put a nine inch in the rear and a Dana 44 in the front, 38, 11 boggers. And I was like, yeah, man, I got me a trail rig. And man, that thing, that's where it all began. It just snowballed from there, you know? So was there a club involved? Did you get involved with a club or just hanging out with friends or how'd you find no. uh, people to wheel with? So this is funny too. My, my brother, my brother-in-law now didn't didn't know he was going to be my brother-in-law then. You know, he had went over to years ago. I'm sure you've heard of it. You know, Teleco Teleco Off Road Park in right. Murphy, North Carolina. You know, that was just such a huge huge place. And uh, I'd I'd been over there with him a time or two. He had an old Ford Bronco, and and that and that's when I was like, man, I really want to start getting into this. And anyhow, ended up getting getting the jeep built and met some folks over there and of course my brother-in-law now and, and a few of his friends which later become a really good friend of mine and actually was my spotter for many years but um that we just started going over there you know a lot of times on <clears throat> through the weekend or whatever we'd go camp and spend like a friday saturday or sunday over there and just just wear it out you know and so then you came across guys like durham and stuff and shoopy or um, no, I, so I didn't really meet those guys. Let's see, that was in, that was probably in 99. I I think I went to an E-Rock event in 02, if that sounds okay. right. Um, Mike Wyke, which was my spotter, um, became my spotter, but it was just, you know, we trail, trail wheeled or whatever all the time. And he said, uh, man, they're having a competition rock crawl in Jellicoe, Tennessee. We ought to go watch. So we went, and, man, I just – instantly fell in love with it. I told him, I said, next year we're going to do this. And that's kind of when I'd met, you know, seen Shoopy and Durham and some of those guys that, that had been at it, you know, since day one. Um, and, and later we, that winter, I actually took my CJ five and ended up, you know, cutting it in back half and doing all tube work and whatnot, putting coilovers on it and um, upgraded a lot of stuff. And we went back in 03, which, was really a huge learning curve for us. I mean, you know, it was a a huge accomplishment if we just, you know, finished the event without tearing it all to pieces. Right. Um, I know, think never... that was the case with a lot of guys back then. <laughs> it was so much to learn, which I was just a kid, you know. Man, I, I look back now, I think I was 20, I think, 21 when I started doing it. I don't know, I was just a kid and uh, just had like this big dream, you know. And, uh, so yeah, that, that's what started was it started in 03. So, so a question, um, your the buddy that you went to Je- uh, Jellico with, you said that he ended up being your, your brother-in-law. So obviously Kim was a little sister. So no, he married the older sisters. Um, oh, it's, uh, okay. yeah, Kim's the, Kim's the middle. Yeah. So back to my football days, Tommy, which is my brother-in-law was, was my football coach. Okay. And, and then, you know, we would practice or whatever. We'd get talking. He told me he had a, you know, an old Bronco and, and he loved going over to Teleco. We ought to go sometime. And of course I always had a kind of a crush on Kim <laughs> back, back in high school, but she was older. She wouldn't have nothing to do with me or whatever. But 
yeah, it's just funny how life works out later ends up being, you know. So you um, scored the older girl. Correct. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. man. <laughs> I give her a hard time still this day. I'm like, maybe whenever I would like, because her younger sister and I were the same grade. And um, we were always really good friends or whatever. And I'd always be like, let's get with your sister. Again. And she would never have anything to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> So let's explore that. How did you get her to do to have to get interest in you? Man, it was um oh god, what was I? We've been together 20 years. I'm 42, so I just turned 22 uh, at, at a bar, <laughs> at okay. a bar drinking, and uh, her sister actually come and pick me up from another party because I was had too much to drink, and I was like, she's like, come down to the bar. Everybody's down here. I was like no way I can make it. She's like, well, we'll send somebody to get you. So they come and pick me up and go to the bar. And she was in there and she was like, like dancing. I'm not really a dancer. So that tells you how much I've had to drink. I thought it was a good idea to go dance. <laughs> <laughs> so I was out there dancing with her and I don't know, just talking shit, I guess. And finally, um, talked her into like giving me a chance, you know, and, uh, she, she tells everybody said, yeah, he never went home after that. Uh, so you yeah, you'd been... had too much to drink. You were <laughs> dancing, <laughs> kind of drunk and yeah, you drunk, put the yeah. moves on and you made and it worked it worked it was yeah it was, wow. it was a success yeah 20 years later man 20 years later two kids you, you must be a good drunk uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or at least that night <laughs> that night anyway yeah that night it, was, it must have been a <laughs> it wasn't a it wasn't a pity date then <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Definitely All right. not. <laughs> so then uh let's get back to the rock crawling then. So early days Jellico, what was that very first event? What did you think that very first event when you got there and you see everybody and you're registering? What was it all like? Man, I, you know, cuz really from 02 to 03, you know, the sport even evolved more, you know, more participants and stuff. And, um, I just, I was just taking it all in. I mean, I was just a kid and I was just, I was just happy to be there. You know, the, the true competitive edge didn't come till, you know, you have one of those events where you end up doing pretty good and you're like, man, I can, I, I can, I can compete with these guys. It, it didn't come that year, you know, in 03, it didn't come that year at all. It was just, again, trying to focus on like, you know, trying to keep the rig together for one and working on a budget, you know, and um, then you start learning, you know, back then every three seconds you had to make forward progress or if it was a point and trying to keep track of your clock and just, there was so much that we were just learning. That's all we were trying to do. I had no expectation whatsoever, you know. What was the, what was the most memorable thing that happened from that first event? Do you remember, is there anything that sticks out? There, there was a course that was that a lot of people were, you know, forty and um, rolling on this and that and the other, and and somehow, man, I we ended up completing the course with like, you know, like a twenty or something like that. And I mean, I was just I, I remember at the end of the course being like, oh my god, like we were one of the seriously, it was like maybe ten people that finished the course, and I remember being like, I think we're starting to get it. <laughs> like there was there was a little bit of light, you know, like a little glimmer of hope that you know we we might be able to do this one day. Um, but that, that was, man, like I said, there, we had so much, so much breakage and stuff tore up. It was just a, it was just a, a miracle to finish a course, you know? Right. So out of those days of competing, who would you say became your closest friend, but was also a competitor? Um, in, in the early days or as time went on? Um, let's say the early days to begin with. You know, Chris, Chris Durham always was. I always really got along with Shoop, um, but Chris Chris always took a lot more time. You know, Chris isn't really a guy of many words. You know, he right. kind of sticks to himself, and and for whatever reason, and, and still to this day, he's one of the very few that I still keep in touch with. And and he he would kind of help me along. You know, give me some <clears throat> pointers and advice. And and like I say, this many years later, he and I we still we don't talk as much as I'd like to, um, especially as close as we kind of live, but. Um, I, I do still keep in touch with him. I haven't talked to Shoopy in, God, man, it's been 12, 15 years. Uh, Buddy Carlton, I haven't, I haven't talked to him in quite some time. And, and no, nothing bad ever happened. It's just life, you know. But for whatever reason, Chris and I, we still keep in touch. You know, he was just, to me, he was 
and he was so talented, you know, um, smart guy. solid dude. And a solid dude. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. And so, uh, I know you're, uh, you're pretty good friends with, uh, with Jesse Haynes. So oh, how yes, did dude. that, uh, how did that all come about? I'm trying to think, um, I believe in, I met him in 05. I think it was 05 that I met him at an event. And, uh, and then in 06, yeah, I ended up buying a, a car from Brian Hamilton. That was the Badlands had built, and it was kind of the single seater front engine that you know you straddled the transmission transfer case, sat on top of it or whatever. Right. And then later, you know, uh, in '06, yeah, the start, of, you know, the well in the winter of '05, '06, um, I called Troy Myers and said, "Hey, I kind of got a vision of something that I, I would like to build, and didn't know if you guys would be interested." And they were they were interested, and and Jesse ended up building. And, uh, that's, that's really when he and I's friendship really took off because he was really, to me, it was a masterpiece what he built, you know, and it was like everything I had in my mind, he, he did it, but excelled, you know, like even took it up another notch. And so I would call him a lot, you know, like advice on how to maybe do something or, you know, build something or whatever. Cause when we got the car back, it was just a roller. And, um, I, you know, the car looked so good. I was like, man, I really don't want to go. I don't want to get this thing done. And everybody be like, well, I can see where Jesse ended and Matt began. You know, <laughs> I wanted it to flow. I wanted it to flow and I wanted it to be a nice looking car. So I, I would call him a lot, you know, and, and, and pick his brain or whatnot. And that's really when our friendship, you know, really took off. That's pretty cool. Excellent. Yeah. And, and so in all those years of, of, of the crawling, what was your, what's your most favorite event site? Event site? Oh, man. Oof. That's a tough one. Um, I loved them all for so many different reasons. Um, so I'm going to give you two. I know, I know that wasn't a question, but I'm going to give you two. That's fine. So Jellico to me was always my favorite just because that's where it all kind of started for me, you know, um, first event I ever watched, first event I ever competed at was at, at Jellico. So it kind of felt like home, you know, right. but I don't know. I really loved the, the Columbus, Ohio man-made course. Oh man. The concrete jungle. Dude, that place was just <laughs> it <was> amazing. <laughs> it was, you know, and, even the one the Portland, the one in Portland, Indiana, it was it was really neat, but I felt like the one in Ohio was just was just amazing. You know, I mean, it was you know three or four times as big, and I don't know, it was it was pretty wild. It it's amazing that they ended up having to tear all that down. The uh, the guy guy Wolfenberger that owned that property <laughs> filled in wetlands to to be able to, to have that site uh-huh. built that and then had us come out and take a look at it. Right. And right. we little rich and I go out there and we're looking at it and I'm like, wow, um, you should have called us before you built it. And he's like, why? And I said, because you know, you, what you got here looks really cool, but it's, there's nothing here that's usable. And he goes, yeah. what do you mean? And I said, they, you can't get cars onto it. There was no, I mean, it was just like a big six foot, eight foot tube, you know, and there was, and this tube stacks and everything else, but there was no way to get on or, or around them. You know, I mean, it was just, you know, they needed to use that as the material to build, but no, you know, so we, we, we started making recommendations and he goes, you know, I'm a, I'm a multimillionaire and I've done all this stuff in my life and I'm not going to listen to no. 20 something year old kid tell me how to build things. And I'm like, well, you know, you're a golfer, right? And he goes, yeah. And I go, well, you had the money to build Augusta national. And instead you, you just built a pitch and putt, you yeah. know? And yeah. I said, so yeah. you better listen to that kid and let's do some work on this. Otherwise it's, you know, we're not going to bring an event here because there's nothing we can do on it. Yeah. Spectator spectator wise, it it wasn't very friendly at all. You know, 
um, that was that was that was definitely a downfall on it. But as far as a driver, um, and the way it was the courses and stuff, and, and the the traction and, and, and the different obstacles, it was it was fun. You know, it was fun to be on. But uh, yeah, I, I can see as as a promoter or or like I said, a spectator. I remember my wife was like, "I can't see shit. Like I can't see anything. I, mean, I don't know what to tell you." You know. Yeah, we when we first went there, I mean, we d- it ended up having a lot of work done until we did the first event to make it so that it was usable. I mean, it, it, literally, you couldn't get onto the tubes. Um, yeah, you know, it was just the way he they had the way they had put it together. But you know, that's that's typical, as you know, somebody that doesn't know anything about crawling trying to build a crawling park. You know, yeah, it's uh, be like you know, I don't know, me going out and building a skyscraper. <laughs> I wouldn't definitely <laughs> go into it. <laughs> so then, um, where was your first win? Oh, um, let me think. Two, yeah, 2005. It was the, actually the first event of 2005. I think it was a U-Rock event. 2005 at Jellico. Um, that was actually when... Marty Hart made his first appearance. Okay. And it, yeah, it was an 05. I remember it was like April. It was into April. So <laughs> we got there on Friday and the weather was awesome. You know, it was like seventies and sunny. And by Sunday it was flirty and snow, you know? <laughs> and, um, anyway, <clears throat> I had bought that car from, um, Brian Hamilton. That was, it was, it still needed to be finished, you know, wired, plumbed, uh, painted and interior done. And again, I was just a kid. I ended up, I bought it from him and I didn't, I spent a bunch of money I didn't really have. <laughs> and I remember telling my spotter and I told my wife at the time, at the time we were just dating, I told her, I was like, this should really either make me or break me. If I can do good, I'll keep doing it. If I can, I'm going to have to get out because, you know, I just spent a lot of money I, I really didn't have. And so I went to that first event and I was like, this is it. I, I got to, got to, got to do good, you know, and stay really focused or whatever. And at the end of the first day, yeah, I think we were beating Marty by like 30 points and, um, ended up coming down. I made a mess out of a course on Sunday and he closed the gap and we were within a couple of points of each other. And I ended up beating, I think it was about one or two points and it was huge, but Marty felt like he had won. He felt like he got done wrong on another course and we kind of got into it at the awards and, uh, I think later had respect for each other, but it, our, our friendship didn't really start off too good. <laughs> right. <laughs> Welcome to crawling. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, he was, I tell you, Marty was a fierce competitor. He wasn't ever really, a, he was a competitor. That's exactly right. He he was a guy that made you, made you drive harder, made you work harder, made you be more mentally prepared, everything. Cause he, cause I promise you, he was going to be ready. And, uh, I, I, Never felt like we were really good friends, but I think we both respect each other. I know I respected him as a competitor, you know. Right. So what was what would you say was your most memorable event? Not not the one you won, but something you know, something an event that that was just larger in life for you. Man, I had so many that's a tough one. I had so many great experiences in rock crawling. Um I mean, like life experiences, I, I think about all the time, really. You know, and it's been been a, been a long time ago. But you know, in '05, that that I did, you know, we won the championship and was able to get a little traction on some sponsorship, and and finally was to the point where I felt like I could breathe, and it wasn't just all coming out of my pocket. And you know, that was that was big. Um, it was in Portland, Indiana. We'd won. And it come down to me and Marty again, and um, I had to beat him by two positions because I think he was ahead. He was ahead by two points or something in the series, and I ended up beating him. He hit a cone or something in the shootout, and I ended up acing the shootout, if I remember correctly. And he ended up, I won, no, I ended up second. He ended up fourth, so I ended up winning the championship, winning the points. And and that was something that, that was big. You know, I, I, I took away – from him and was super proud, but you know, probably the We Rock in 07 in uh Spring, Texas. Um, we, we ended up third, but I remember the level of competition was huge. You know, that was 
Shannon Campbell, Jesse, um, Tracy Jordan was there. Jason Polly was there. Uh, I'm sure I'm missing him. What was the what was the Bruce guy that Zeller? Yep, BZ. he was there. Yep, there you go. That's him. There was there was just a lot of big names there and a lot of competition. And um, I finished third, and I was I was proud of that. You know, super proud. We were actually in the lead for a, a good bit, and I was on my next to last course. And the car, I went to front dig and let off the brake. Um, and the car was in such a bind, so much pressure. Actually, when I let off the brake, the, it pushed the car back into the cone and barely touched it. And we went from like first to like sixth or fifth or something like that and ended up coming in the shootout and made up a couple of places and ended up third. And that was a, it was a really memorable event for me for some reason. It just, um, I, I, again, I think it was just all the big names and the level of competition, you know? Yeah. I think that was, that was one of those heyday events where, you know, it was before the, the economy took a dump and people started you know, leaving the sport and, yeah. you know, we, the turnouts were really good at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And then, you know, there was a lot of great events in, in 06. We were running your series and we were running, um, you rock. And I, I, I what was the, what was the one in Pennsylvania? New rock, new rock. Yep. Yeah. We were running all three and, um, it was, there was a lot of great events, but for whatever reason, I, I think it was the first championship win and, and, for whatever reason, the, the We Rock in 07, that was, that was big. That was big for me, you know. Awesome. So what was your absolutely worst nightmare experience um, event? I know, that, I, I know there's got to be one that comes to my mind that oh, happened to you. Yeah, there's, 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 yeah, anybody that did it long enough, they had to have one or two or five or whatever, you know. Um, oh. I'm going to throw in, I'm going to throw in Missouri. Yes. Missouri was always a disaster. Yes. And that, that it's between that or when we went to Tyler, Texas, it was just like, what could go wrong went wrong. And, but I, I got to say Missouri in 08, the start of 08. And I don't know. I think it was just a whole snowball effect. The fact that the economy was starting to tank diesel fuel was up to 429 a gallon. Um, sponsors were starting to say, Hey, um, we're not going to be able to give what we talked about, you know, and I, I treated it like a budget, you know, like a business. I, I ran a budget, you know, at the beginning of the season and, and really tried to stick by that. You know, I was, I was a kid. I made good money. I did as straight out of school and I, I worked, worked at the shop and I made really good money, but you know, for a 20 something year old kid to be doing it on that level, it, it's kind of out of touch with reality when you're competing against grown men that have successful businesses. And, you know, it, it also drove me to do good, you know, and, and put probably a lot of pressure on myself that wasn't really fair. But at the same time, also the reality was if I don't win, we don't continue to do this. I've got to win that money. You know, that's the only way I can, the only way we can keep coming back. And, and I, I loved it and I still love it. I would give it anything to be able to rewind time and do it again. But, you know, it, it was, it was probably the end, you know, I'd spend a bunch of money and midway through the winter, I get some calls from, from sponsors and they say, Hey, um, this is only what we can do, you know? So we go and first event, <clears throat> our first obstacle will pull up, cars kind of sidling in the bind or whatever. And I elected just to front burn it really quick. And when I did, it, it didn't exactly shoot and go down the hill it kind of went forward and then shot and did a big cartwheel roll and broke a ring in the motor uh power steering pump the main shaft and the power steering pump broke it was just a disaster you know and i just i just told my wife i was like my heart's just not in it um i i'm just i, I felt discouraged you know i guess because of everything that was going on and um i knew what it cost just to go out there and back and diesel fuel and then your motel and you're like I got, I got to win or I don't come out. You know, if I don't win, I, I'm, it's either first or nothing. And first obstacle, you know, you pull up and you have all that. And as much as it broke my heart and, and I didn't want to do it, I, I just, I knew it was probably in my best interest just to, to step out because I felt like maybe that's the way the sport was going to go. You know, like because of a lot of the chatter, people calling and being like, man, I, I don't know if I can afford to do this. And I, 
I was here I was with two cars and enclosed trailer and all this stuff and I said man I gotta be able to get something out of this so I, I sold out you know and I, I think it was the right decision at the time but man I, it was an it wasn't an easy decision you know right wasn't didn't that during that that event that or leading up to that event on the way there um you had a somebody sideswiped oh. your trailer and stuff or oh something? shit i forgot yeah you're right i forgot about that i mean i just remember no. you getting there and it was just it just it was oh, just a dude. terrible shit show for you it and was all, totally all out of your control dude no you're exactly right i forgot about that i, I guess maybe maybe i tried to put it out of my mind right. um, <laughs> no you're right so uh, a good friend of mine that helped me in the shop a lot he was um He's from North Carolina, but he lives downstage, probably three hours from me. But he was going to college here at Western, which is, you know, really close. And anyway, he loved off-roading. I would imagine he still fools with it. And he, he would come to my shop a lot and just, you know, instead of staying up there at college or whatever, he'd come there and help me with the buggy a lot. And anyhow, he was like, hey, I said, we're going to Missouri. He said, do you care if I go? I'll help you drive. I said, no, I don't mind a bit. And I bought a Hallmark Edge. It was like a 28-foot bumper pool, nice trailer. Um, so we traveled. We were like probably Nashville, I guess, somewhere in there. Been on the road about six hours. And I said, man, I'm I'm going to pull over and get some fuel. And so I get fuel. We get back in the truck. He said, you want me to drive? And I was like, man, I'm not really sleepy, but we still got a ways to go. Yeah, if you, if you want to drive, that's fine. So we're getting on the on-ramp. And he's like, I'm talking. And he's like, why's your truck shaking? I was like, I don't know. Give it a little more fuel. I think, you know, maybe it'll, I don't know. <laughs> I'm half paying attention to what he's talking about. Well, all of a sudden, the truck and trailer starts, like, going back and forth, back and forth. And I'm like, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. We got got it slowed down to, like, 35 and ended up jackknifing. What happened was the car somehow coming strapped in the trailer. Oh, jeez. It rolled, the weight went to the back of the trailer. The buggy went, you know, you're accelerating. So the, the buggy's probably like creeping back to the back, behind, you know, picking up on the back of the truck. So anybody that's pulled the trailer, you know, like what, what happens. What is weird, though, is I don't, I'm assuming that's what happens or happened because one of the trailer tires blew. And it wasn't the side that we hit the guardrail. It was on the other side. Because hmm. it it just like delaminates. So I don't know if the tire blew like right and got it, got it going crazy like that. But the way the way the truck was acting and it was you know j- you know swerving back and forth, it was almost like the buggy had come unstrapped. Because when I opened the door, it was unstrapped. But again, it could have been the impact. But anyway, yeah, truck ends up jackknife. Trailer uh, is up on the guardrail. Um, there we are, two three in the morning on the side of the road, just trying trying to get get it off the guardrail. So yeah, God, I forgot about that. Good memory. I wasn't sure what happened then at that event when you showed up. And I just remember that it was that you were not in a good mood at that point when, before you started. <laughs> it, was, it was hard to get my mind back in it. You're, right. you're exactly right. Yeah. And then, yeah, the first obstacle, man, we pull up and that happens and motors not running right, power steering pump. I was just like, man, I can't. I just, I don't, I don't have it in me. I just pulled it in the trailer, went, home, went back to the motel, took a shower, went to bed, got up the next morning, and I didn't even pull in the event side. Didn't attempt to fix it, nothing, just come on home, you know? Right. So then, how many, uh, how much longer did you compete after that? That, so I sold out. I, ne- I never, never run another event. Um, I think I took, I took that season off. Man, I, I don't know, Big Rich, if it was 09 or 10. Um, I want to say it was 10. A lot of people were kind of coming back, you know, like they kind of caught their breath and was like, hey, we, you know, we survived the storm. You know, we made it through. I think we're going to try to compete. So I decided to build another buggy um, and ended up, remember Rich and Ryan from Michigan? Yes. Um, they they built the chassis. Um it was a two C it kind of looked a lot like, you know, Jason Polly's the way he had done his stuff. It was kind of a similar car like that and put an LS in it, had uh nine inch front, uh, front and rear, uh, 60 outer stuff. Anyway, it was a super cool car, nice, uh, clean car. 
And then I went back and ran, I think I just went to um, Dayton, Tennessee, uh, three or four times and 10, three times. Did, did you guys go there three times that year? Twice. Twice. Okay. Okay. So I went there twice. And then I think the start of 11, did you guys start the season there in 11? Mm, I don't know if we started the season there, but uh, yeah, we were, yeah, I don't were remember back, the, the Were order. you back there in 11? I, did you, I, my memory's bad. Mine is too. Anyway, I, I remember, you know, whenever I built it, I was like, man, I just, I really don't, I don't really want a lot of sponsorship. I don't really want any because I don't, I don't want to feel obligated, you know, to go to be at certain events. And so anyway, I didn't really ask for anything or call anybody, just kind of build it or whatever. And, uh, I ran it two or three times that year, however many times, twice, I guess. And I want to say the next year in the spring, um, I ran it one more time and a guy out of Texas called me and said, I want to buy your buggy. And I was like, uh, season because i remember saying the season just started if you want call me back like in october and i would i will entertain the idea of selling it and he was pretty adamant and he said um price it so i priced it and back then he said give me your bank account number and uh i'll transfer the funds and i was like okay (laughs) so i give him my number and thinking yeah right so i go I, i leave work at lunchtime i go to town i run the bank and I went by, and sure enough, he had made the deposit. And I was like, oh, damn. So a week later, he picked it up, and I never never built another one. Never even uh, sat in the seat of another one until 2015 when Jesse did his super, uh, crawl. super crawl. Yep. Right. Yep. So it had been four or five years since I'd sat in the seat of one. What was it like getting back into it? And then now you were driving Jesse's rig then, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, you know, <laughs> a lot of people, you know, that's when he did the vote in Poland. So a lot of people were like, you think, you think you can still do it? And I'm like, oh, I think, I mean, I guess, I don't, hell, I don't know. And I, I went to tech that, that evening or whatever, and I got in the car and I took a piece of tape, some tape and a, a Sharpie, some white tape and a Sharpie and labeled a couple things um, just for, for myself, you know, to familiarize you know that way if i i can look down and make sure okay that one's for front dig or that's you know rear locker disengaged this and that and the other and you know it come back to me so fast i, I was actually shocked at how quick it come back to me um that the first obstacle I, I, I was super nervous i was like man I, I really don't know it's been five years i don't i don't know if i can do this and but it, it's it's I would even get her to say now, I feel like if I were to get in a car that was relatively competitive, I, I feel like I would still be competitive, you know, maybe not. I don't know. Interesting. Okay. What did you do in that meantime? I mean, you were working at the, the body shop at that time, your dad's body shop. Yeah. <clears throat> You're talking about like after, um, well, after I sold my last car. Well, during, during that time, let's, let's go back to work history before, um, when you were really young and you just got into it, you were working at the body shop. Yeah, mm-hmm, sure was. Yeah, yeah, working, um, working for my dad, um, straight out of high school, and like I said, I took, I went night classes in college for two and a half years, but um, I was still, you know, working on my buggy or whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, that's that was really, man, I I breathe, eat, sleep, and breathe it. You know, I mean, if I was, as soon as I get off work, man, I would stay out there and work on that thing till two or three in the morning go to bed, get up at, you know, seven again, <laughs> go back to work at eight. And I, I would, I would do it for months, you know, but I was just that eager and that driven by it. I just, I loved it. You know, I mean, it was just all I really thought about. And then you, uh, so you working at the body shop. Did you continue that? How, how long did you work, work for your dad or do you? Still- um, no, we sold the business. Um, as time went on, uh, I, I don't even really know how old it was or how long I'd been there, but become a partner um, as I got more invested and got older. And um, my dad, he was about to be 62. And man, we were both, we were both burnt out. I mean, really, he had, I'd been there for 22 and a half years and he had been there for 47 and a half or whatever it was. And 
the the industry had really changed. No insurance company that had really started getting more and more control on the industry and they kind of control what you made. And it's it just, it was just getting to be a lot of frustration and, and dealing with the public, you know, uh, people right. aren't, they, people aren't what they used to be. You know, they're just not, I mean, people suck nowadays compared to what they were right. 15, 20 years ago. You know, it's just the world we live in. And anyhow, he was, he was ready to retire. And I was, I was not wanting to continue. I mean, I was, I was just done. I was burnt out. I was, nothing ever felt like a challenge, you know, like it was just a job, you know, and he come to me one day and he said, uh, what's your plans? Like, what do you want to do? I said, dad, I'm going to be honest with you. The only reason I'm here is for you. If you want to walk away right now, I'm good. You know? And he said, I need, I need, I need to be here two more years. I said, okay. I said, um, I'll, I'll stay here with you. But in two years, you know, I had, I'd had a lot of opportunities to do other things and good opportunities. And I, I, I didn't take them, you know, just cause my dad, <coughs> excuse me, he's, he's always been like my, <coughs> my best friend. <clears throat> and, uh, he said, uh, I told him, I said, I'll stay here as long as you do. But when you're done, I'm done. And, uh, Sure enough, two years later, that day came, and he was uh, he was ready to quit, and I was too. And so it's crazy. We were in the process of, you know, we finished up our last few jobs, and we were kind of sorting through. And a guy comes up and said, uh, "I heard you guys were, you know, closing up." And we're like, "Yeah." He said, well, "I'm interested in buying the place." And I was like, "Oh, even better." So we ended up. Um, selling him the place with the majority of the equipment, you know, our personal hand tools and some of the stuff we actually, you know, I took, took to my shop here at my house or whatever, but yeah, it, it worked out great, man. It was, it, it couldn't ask for better timing. We ended up selling him, um, actually did an owner finance deal and for five years. And so, uh, I think he's got another year and a half and the balloon payment comes, but in the meantime, he's making a monthly payment. And, yeah, everything's been good. You know, I, I wasn't going to do anything for a while. I, I'd been working since I was 16 years old. And, you know, if I wasn't in, if I wasn't playing football, then I was at the shop. And I'd just been around it since I was a kid, too. You know, even in my five, six, seven, eight year old, I was, I was that's where I spent my summers. I didn't spend them at the pool. I, I didn't spend them at summer camp. I spent them at, at the shop, you know. And so, anyway, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat myself for a while. I don't know how long it'll last, but I'm, I'm not going to do nothing. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I made it three weeks. <laughs> three weeks. And, uh, yeah, and I was absolutely bored out of my mind. Um, <laughs> first week was pretty cool. Second week wasn't bad. The third week, I was like, oh, my God, I can't do this. So Kim and I, we bought um, an extension, uh, some property that joined us to our farm. It was also farmland. And we had to buy the house that went with the land in order to buy it. They, didn't, they wouldn't separate it. So what's funny how things work is – uh, one of my best friends was working for this guy building houses. And he said, Hey, he's kind of younger and was just went out on his own. He said, Hey, his name's Dallas. He said, uh, Dallas is looking for, for a house. You might want to show him that one. I said, yeah, man, we're going to have to sell this thing. I, I didn't really want to have to buy the house, but we did. So he ends up buying the house. We kept the land and, uh, we we're sitting around burning some brush one night and drinking beer. And he said, so what are you going to do now? And I was like, I don't know, man. I said, I, don't, I haven't really thought much about it. I said, I'm not going to do anything for a month or so, but maybe one day or whatever, I'll get into something. He said, well, if you ever need a job, you can come work with me. And I was like, okay. Well, three weeks into my retirement, you know, I, I got up, took the kids to school, come back home. I was like drinking coffee, watching TV, watching the news. And I looked at the clock. It was 1030 in the morning. I hadn't done shit. I was like, Oh boy, this is not, this is not for me. I'm not, I'm not this guy. I gotta, I gotta get back to work. So I called him. I said, man, you still need help. He was like, yeah, like yesterday. And I was like, sweet. When you want me to start? And he said, how about Monday? I said, that'll work. So, um, started building houses with him three, a little over three years ago. It was one of the best moves I've ever made. Um, I, I absolutely love it. I mean, it's, it's one of uh, one of the best things I've ever done for myself, you know. So you're actually out there pounding nails? Yeah, yeah. I, I, 
we do we do everything. I mean, we do it all. Um, guy work. He's a super talented guy. I've learned a lot from him. And you know, my father in law Kim and I went. We got together. Um, we've been together maybe a year, and we built a house together. Um, me and her and her dad, my dad and an uncle. We built our first house, and it was a it was a big nice house. And I learned a lot as a kid. You know, um, twenty three, twenty four, whatever I was, and. Um, in the meantime, of course, we later, he, he and I built a shop at that, at that house and then built a barn. And I, so I always liked it. I always, it always, I don't know, it, it interests me. And I, I think the fact that you could get so much satisfaction in an eight hour day, like you could look back in eight hours and be like, damn, we got a lot done in eight hours. It was rewarding, you know? Right. And so I always kind of had like a, 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 a love for it. It interests me a lot. So whenever I went, I wasn't completely blind to it. You know, I, I knew a little bit about it, but man, in three years I've, I've caught on quick and I've learned a lot. And man, I think in one year, me, him and another guy, we built eight houses in a year. Wow. Very good. And yeah, we, we, we're building a house right now. It's a, it's only a million dollar guest house. <laughs> wow. And, and it's got a 200 year old timber frame inside of it. Um, the timber frame came from, uh, Wisconsin, 1839 is when when it was built, and this guy bought the bought the old barn and had it tore down and shipped here, and we actually assembled the timber frame first and then built the house around it. That sounds pretty sweet. Yeah, it's it's something it's something to see. It's it's pretty pretty incredible. So let's talk about about Matt D's the cowboy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's man. First time um, I saw, first time I saw a photo of you on the, on the, on the horse, I was like, well, that's not something I thought I'd see. Yeah. <laughs> you know, man, it's neither did I really. I mean, and whenever I tell you my whole like life now is based around it. Yeah, I mean, it really is. I mean, uh, and, and I even ask him some days, I'm like, how the hell did we get in this situation? Like, where, <laughs> you know, where did, how did this hobby become our lifestyle? Like our, our way of life. I mean, really, um, it, it, is, it is interesting. So little backstory on that. Um, I told you, you know, we had family in Florida and race horses in Florida are, is, you know, Ocala area. That's, that's kind of the capital. Well, I had an uncle, um, my mom's sister's husband, was trained racehorses in Florida. So ever since I was a kid, when we would go at Christmas time or <clears throat> whenever and visit, my, I'd always want to go out to the barn with him and hang out because I was always kind of fascinated by him, you know, big, powerful animal like that and just uh, some, you know, just watching him work with him and train him and whatnot. And, uh, my, my parents didn't have a clue about them, you know, and I want one, but it's like, you know, we don't really have, they had a lot of land, but they didn't have the land, that type of land to keep horses on. And I was racing and I was like, eh, you know, whatever. Well, I got horses before, before I got out of rock crawling, but they were just like pleasure, enjoyable type horse, you know, um, just kind of a hobby horse, basically. Well, when I got out of rock crawling, I, I found, I was like, damn, I got more time to go ride my horse. So, you know, ended up with some buddies like riding more and this and that and the other. And it, it kind of evolved just like the rock crawling did. Um, like, hey, man, they, they're having a big straightaway event for speed horses in t um, a place in Tennessee. And I was like, yeah, I'd like to go see what that's about. And we always rode more of a pleasure type horse. Well, when you go to these events, it, it's a full on performance horse. You know, I mean, it's their full standard bred is what they are. They're ex, like basically horses off the track that they've taught that, that are not a buggy horse anymore. Now they're a riding horse. And I was just like, Oh my God, I got to get into this. This is awesome. You know? And, um, it's like anything it's, it's a, it's a hellacious learning curve. And if you're determined enough, you got enough like drive about it, then sure you're going to get better and you're going to learn stuff and you're, before you know it, you're going to be 
you're going to be winning championships, you know, just like the rock crawling. And, and that's kind of where I got with the horses, you know, is um, just started educating myself and, and fooling with them more and more and more and figuring out what bloodline and to get into. And um, still, I still learn today, you know, I mean, I, I've been I'm kind of on top of the game and had a lot of success with it as well. And um, I still, still learn every day with it, you know. And uh, that's awesome. Let's uh, let's talk about family a little bit. So you've been okay. married. You've been with Kim now. You said twenty twenty two years. Twenty 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 years. Yeah, twenty years. Yeah. Yep. And uh, kids. Yeah. So Oakland is eleven, and um, Hudson is he'll be six in next month in February. He'll be six. Nice. And they're uh, they're obviously if you're deep into horses they probably are too yeah oakland for sure um huddy huddy has rode a little bit um i tell you it's you'll see some kids riding when they're when they're real real little three four they're more or less a passenger you know um (laughs) i really a, a kid doesn't mentally mature enough to start riding a horse in my opinion well mine like six seven years old so the little bit that he's rode, it's been pretty controlled or whatever. Now, Oakland, uh, he's 11, and I was a little more pushy with him when I started, and he's actually turned into be a, a pretty incredible he's, – he's really a good rider, especially no more than he gets to ride. Oakland plays every single sport coming and going. He plays year-round. Um, literally, we'll get done with one sport. Sometimes they overlap, and we're practicing for – you know, football and basketball at the same time or basketball and baseball. And then he also does a lot of times where he travel, does travel league with some other teams and stuff, you know, he'll go play a tournament for a week, a long weekend or something and got to practice for that. So <clears throat> his horse showing once, once basketball's over, so springtime, March, he'll, he'll get to ride a little bit, but uh, he'll show through the summer months. But now once football starts in July, He's done. He 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 only gets to show like April, May, June, and maybe like the first or second weekend in July. So his riding's getting has gotten cut short. But he really he caught on quick, and and he's he's turned into a pretty pretty good rider. I mean, he competes on a pretty big level, and he's had a lot of success. You know, awesome, great, yeah. And so I understand that you uh, that you actually put a a horse event on yourself. You became yeah, a promoter. Yeah. Yeah, hey man, it um, you would have been proud of me. Yeah, it it turned out really big. Um, you know, a lot of these shows we go to, a lot of times it's bragging rights. You know, you get a trophy, and and there might be a little bit of money involved. And I guess just coming from a world of motorsports, I was always baffled. You know, we would leave we would leave these shows, and I would just tell Kim, I'd be like, these people go crazy over a thousand bucks. You know, like, and it's it. And it's it's very rare. Like you never you never hear of it, or you see it maybe once a year or whatever. And I told her I was like, we ought to put a show on, get some sponsorship, and really like pump it up, make it big. Man, we started this. It was actually November of last year when we started planning our our show for May. And man, we ended up getting like we had a, we had some major payback in it. Uh, a lot of people said. You know, they'd never seen that had been ho- showing horses their whole life. They said we'd never seen a show with payback like that, nor have we ever seen a show that big. So it, it was a big success. I mean, it was it was pretty pretty incredible, really. I I think we had eleven different states. Um, had a lady there from Belgium that she had flew in for the show. Um, I had a professional football player there, Devin White, that plays for the Tampa Bay Bucks, was there um showing his horse there it, it was a big thing it was a really big thing we plan to do it again this year excellent excellent cool so uh what's in the future for the d's uh, probably it's gonna it's probably gonna be up to these kids you know they they right <laughs> man you know kim and i we we didn't start having kids till we were 30 31 32 i guess i was 30 she was 32 and um 
you know, we, we did that for a reason. You know, we, we, we traveled the world rock crawling, um, made a lot of great memories and, and got to do a lot of fun stuff. And, and we finally said, Hey, if we're going to do this, this time, you know, we're not getting any younger, but if we're going to do this, well, then <clears throat> we want to be able to be the best parents we can be as far as being able to finance, you know, and speaking in financially and, and just saying, Hey, we want to be able to, we want to be able to chase him around, you know, year long. If, if that's what he wants to do, if he wants to play ball year round, we want to be able to, in a position where we can do that. Right. And so that's what we did. So when I say it's kind of up to them, it's up to them. Um, do I find myself daydreaming and wishing that I could get back into rock crawling? And I, I'd be lying if I said I did because I, I think about it a lot. And I guess if I knew, you know, People ask me all the time, would you would you quit horses to get back into rock crawling if it would be like it used to be? The answer is, yeah, probably would. I, and, and I love the horses, man. I, I've grown to love them. They, they it, it, they're just like rock crawling. They make you they make you hit the person that you are today. You know, they teach you a lot. Teach you patience. Teach you sometimes things don't go the way you want them to go, and you got to learn to be okay with it. And it's tough, you know. Um, especially whenever it's uh, something that's got a mind of its own. Right. You can only do so much because they're just like us. They're going to have good days and they're going to have bad days. They're going to have days where, man, they're on. And then they're going to have days where it's you, you want to kill them. You know, you're just like, what is wrong with this thing today? I mean, it's just, just the way it goes. And But, yeah, I would if I if I was guaranteed, hey, man, Rock Crohn's fixing to make a huge comeback and it's going to be what it was, 05, 06, and 07, um, I would start making phone calls today. Interesting. Cool. Well, Matt, I want to say thank you so much for, for spending the time and talking about your life and, uh, and all your accomplishments and everything you've been through. Man, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I've enjoyed it. Um, I, I, I really, I really appreciate it. I really do. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we get to see you sometime down the road. Absolutely, man. Keep in touch. And, uh, if you need anything, you got my number. All right, Matt. Thank you. And, uh, you know, good luck. And, and I hope all the best for you and your family in the future. All right, Rich. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. See ya. Well, that's another episode of Conversations with Big Rich. I'd like to thank you all for listening. If you could do us a favor and uh, leave us a review on any podcast service that you happen to be listening on, or send us an email or a text message or a Facebook message, And let me know uh, any ideas that you have, or if there's anybody that you have that you think would be a great guest, please forward the contact information to me so that we can uh, try to get them on. And always remember, live life to the fullest. Enjoying life is a must. Follow your dreams and live life with all the gusto you can. Thank you.